it's Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series and I'm very excited. I'm here to introduce to you a new playlist on our YouTube channel. That's right, we've got a YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed and you haven't clicked on that button, then you have to do it before you keep watching this video because you just won't see the rest of it. But what it is, is we're actually starting up the Be All and End All series. And these are little works and quirks that we've come across with over the few years that we've been doing this. And particularly people that we've talked to in a number of situations and they've given us their advice and we've thought, far out, that's a really good little trick. We've got to, we've got to get that out there, otherwise it's going to get forgotten. So one of the things I want to talk about today is oil and coolant. And people probably go, well, my mechanic takes care of that. Well, no, you're wrong. When you're out in an extreme environment, you are the mechanic and you are the cook too. So depending on whether you're a good cook or not, will depend on how happy you are. But depending on whether you're a bad mechanic or not, will depend on how happy your car is or not. And having a happy car and a happy chappy Land Rover is very, very important. So one of the key things I'm going to talk about now is coolant systems and cooling systems in combustion engines, particularly in relation to a desert environment. And these are some of the things that we've found in our own expedition and own experience in Seriously Series Road to Ruin, where we actually took on the Canning stock route and actually travelled through the Great Victorian Desert and into the Gibson Desert. One of the things that we found was the actual radiant heat from the red sand and the reason why it's red is due to the amount of iron oxide actually in it which gives it that red orange colour. It was actually radiating off the ground so much so that it was actually causing the motor to heat up more even at an ambient temperature and also the wind temperature too. We were looking at a temperature of roughly around about 40 to 43 degrees. So it was very, very hot. And sadly, the Land Rover held its own, but it needed a few little rest breaks to catch its breath. And Damon luckily pointed out a few little tricks that we could do along the way. Now, how your coolant system works is very, very simple. Uh, this here is a 2.6 litre Rover six cylinder motor and this is a really good example I think of the evolution of the coolant system and really what we're looking at today e even though it is a 50 year old design. Obviously we have the water or the coolant stored in the radiator. We have obviously we have a pipe coming out of the motor and a pipe going into the motor. and Basically, the suction and the, and the pump, or the actual uh, water getting jetted back into the radiator, is due to the water pump itself. And that's driven, particularly off this one, off the actual crank. Now, sometimes that just isn't enough. And one of the, re one of the ways that you can actually get a little bit more oomph out of your coolant system, or even help to cool it down, is actually using your heater box here. One of the key things that we did is we actually left our heater on. And I know you're probably thinking that's crazy in 40 degree heat. But, you know, you do what you have to do, like taking the door tops off. But at times where we were crossing sand dunes and it was actually getting really quite hot, we'd actually leave the vehicle for probably 15 minutes, half an hour. We'd have a bit of a break. Um, we'd sort out a bit of content, we'd check over the vehicle and just that little fan going would actually bring the temperature gauge down just enough to get it within the acceptable range and then we were able to shoot off again. So that, that's a really good little trick there. Something that's also been experienced in Central Australia with the extreme heat and the fact that the radiator just doesn't seem to be effective enough in front of the vehicle here is that one key individual, it was actually Lassiter's son and this guy Lassiter is a really interesting fellow to have a look at. Uh, it's, a, it's a sad, sad story but he set out, I believe it was in the 1920s, to search for this gold reef that he'd found in his youth 
and cut a long story short, he actually ended up perishing. And his son, ever since then, has ventured out to the same area each year and trying to find out where this reef is. And luckily, I think it was last year, um, they actually found it. So it's good to have a bit of closure. But one of the vehicles that he used was actually the Series 3 and he used the Series 2 Land Rovers. And one of the adaptations that he actually did was he pulled out the radiator and he actually stuck it up on the roof. Now, this sounds a bit ridiculous, but it actually allows a lot more airflow to actually get through the radiator. And obviously it worked because he repeated it on a number of expeditions out there. So it's a bit odd. It's one that raises a few eyebrows, but it does actually work. Now, the 2.6 litre, if you're not aware of it, is actually a really interesting motor. A lot of people hate it, but I actually quite like it. It's not a bad motor if you keep the maintenance up to it, and particularly keeping clean oil in it. Now, it differs a lot to the 2.25 litre in a number of different ways, and I won't go into that today. We'll do that in a future video. But one of the key things that it has is it actually has an alloy head on it. And this was something that was starting to become more and more and more per, uh, more and more common um, in vehicles, particularly to the end of the 1960s and particularly into the 1970s. And nowadays, you'll be hard to find any motor in a vehicle that is from top to bottom cast iron. Now, what does this have in relation to cooling systems? Well, it actually has quite a lot. So. With a cast iron block, all your early combustion motors were cast iron, pretty much all of them. The head on them was bronze, and with that, cooling really wasn't considered too much of an issue. They would just put water through. Didn't matter what it was, it would just be any water you could find. You could put pond water through it if you wanted to. It didn't matter. And the motors had such high tolerances too, so they could take it. But once you started getting alloys and particularly lower tolerances and motors, this just wasn't acceptable anymore. The reason being is you're heating, a, you're heating water up to 80 degrees centigrade or above that. Now, when water becomes over 80 degrees centigrade, or in particular over 100 degrees centigrade, it becomes much more reactive. Now this is like anything in general. If you want something to react a lot, lot better, heat it up a little bit. The old trick of getting the car battery and putting it by the campfire to help it charge up is a prime example of that. Just make sure if it's lead acid that you've got all the cell, uh, just make sure if it's a lead acid battery that you've actually got all the cells open. But this is the case for your alloy heads and your alloy blocks. It literally chews it out and creates a honeycomb effect. And this means that you go through head gaskets a lot quicker and you go through engine blocks a lot quicker too. And the way that they actually came about fixing or mediating this problem was actually through industrial alcohol called glycol. And this started to become more and more common throughout the 70s. And particularly in regards to Land Rover and Range Rover, the 100 horsepower V8 or the 3.5 litre V8 um, was one that was a prime case of blowing head gaskets prior to this actual cooling coming out. The Triumph Stag was another one that was prone for it too. And there's a few other issues behind that, but glycol cooling certainly would have helped it out quite a bit. There's an interesting story behind that. A uh, guy I worked with, uh, Terry Weiner, who was a or who was a driller and now is uh, in charge of safety OHS in at a mine site over in Kalgoorlie. He had quite a story to tell, and he was working down at this place called Jubilee, and there was a couple of old prospectors around there, and this guy always had a tin mug in his hand. It didn't matter what time of day, he always had a tin mug, and he was always sipping from it. Anyway, they helped them out one day, these prospectors, and Terry said, oh, look, we'll, we'll give you some beer, we'll give you some alcohol. Um, that's what you do in Australia. And um, 
He said, no, 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 it's all good, it's all okay, we've, we've got plenty here. He goes, you sure? He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And he goes, what you got in the cup, mate? He goes, oh, I've got coolant. He had radiator coolant with a bit of water and he was just sipping it. So he was drinking industrial strength alcohol, which can actually do a lot, a lot to you. But obviously, this guy was in his 80s, so... It didn't really matter if he was going to drop dead in six months or drop dead in five years. But interesting story. One of the other things we found in a desert environment that's really important is actually getting the right viscosity of oil. Now this is something a lot of people get wrong. Now you open up a workshop manual these days, not many people do that, you look on a forum or an app, and you go, oh, it takes 20W50 or it takes 0 dash. 15 oil or 1040 or whatever. Oh, that's what it takes. Yep, that's what it takes. That's all it takes. Well, depending on what environment you're going going to or traveling through, you, you need to look at adjusting that a little bit. Because if it's 37 degrees centigrade outside, then the actual block is probably going to be sitting at maybe 30 degrees. And that's where it's starting from. And if your coolant system isn't quite functioning enough, then your oil is actually going to heat up a lot quicker. It's going to heat up a lot quicker. You're actually going to find yourself burning a bit of oil. So it's really important to get that viscosity right. And particularly on older motors too, where there's a little bit more give and play, you really want to make sure that you've tested a couple of different oils or done a compression test before you actually set off on a trip. One of the things that Land Rover actually offered, uh, particularly for the African market, was actually an oil cooler system. And this is probably something that we'll actually fit and look at doing for our next series, um, which we'll end up venturing off out to the desert once again, most likely, after our Tasmanian uh, series that we'll be filming here in a few weeks' time. Now, the way that these work is really quite interesting. And it functions on the same principles of a radiator. So you've got these two coils here, and they've got tiny, tiny fins. And you're probably thinking, why are the fins so small? Now, if you look at that into relation to radiators, you'll go, why is it better to have more cores or less cores in my radiator? Well, it's very simple, very simple. Bigger isn't always better, and in this case it isn't. The smaller it is, or the smaller the actual core your radiator is, the more you can fit in. The more you can fit in means the larger surface area, which means more air can actually penetrate through a larger volume of coolant and can actually cool it down. And the same, and it is exactly the same for this oil cooling system here. The air hits it first, not the radiator. And that, all it has to do is cool it down maybe two, three, five degrees. And then that can flow back through into the oil filter and flow back through into the motor. And that'll stop the oil from actually vaporising and then getting burnt in the combustion chamber. And then stops you from having to put as much oil into your motor. So there's a few little tips for today. And there'll be more coming. So please keep an eye out on this playlist and please subscribe to this page. And we'll catch you later on.